Okay. Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear us? Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Nadine Salah. I'm the marketing manager for the MENA region um, at Emerald uh, Group Publishing. And um, today we're going to go uh, through the Emerald AUC School of Business case writing competition, um, in which we will cover um, all about the case writing methodologies and teaching uh, methods. Um, and um, I just wanted to start with a couple of housekeeping uh, items. This webinar is going to be recorded and will be sent to the email that you registered with following the session. Please feel free to share with uh, to share this uh, with your colleagues. The session should last one hour. If you want to ask questions as we go, feel free to put this in the question panel, which we will find on the right-hand side of your screen in the GoToWebinar viewer. We will have time to answer your questions at the end. And very quickly, if I may ask, uh, it's nice to see where everyone uh, has been joining us from. Uh, for instance, our panelists today are talking to you from Egypt and from the USA. Um, and on that, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce our guest speakers for today. Uh, Inji Magdi, who is the director at the El Khazandar Business Research and Case Center at the American University in Cairo School of Business. Shireen El Bouwiti, who is a senior specialist at El Khazandar Business Research and Case Center at the American University uh, School of Business. Inji and Shireen, they have been our partners in conducting the competition for the last four years. They're bringing in their knowledge and experience and given that the KCC at the AUC is one of the leading centers for case writing in the MENA region. We have Professor Michael Goldman, who is the editor-in-chief of the Emerging Markets Case Studies in Emerald Publishing, and he is uh, the associate professor at the University of San Francisco. We have Professor Ahmad Tolba, who is the associate professor of marketing and chair of management department, AUC School of Business. And finally, we will have Melissa Cole, who is the comm commissioning lead for cases at Emerald Publishing. And now I'm going to hand over to Inji. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it gives us great pleasure, pleasure that we're hosting this webinar in partnership with Emerald. And this is part of the activities that we do uh, under the umbrella of the Emerald AUC School of Business Case Writing Competition that we launch aiming at having more and more cases from the region. And we'll be talking about this more throughout the webinar. Uh, and actually what makes this webinar really, really special and unique is having two of the top case experts worldwide being with us, Dr. Michael Goldman and Dr. Ahmad Tolba. Uh, and we are truly uh, looking forward to hearing more from them about the case writing methodologies and the case usage. So please um, feel free to ask whatever questions you want in the chat box and make the best use of this amazing opportunity. Yes, I, I could not agree more. And um, now I think we can start with uh, Professor Michael Goldman's uh, book. You can feel you can feel free to guide me, Professor Michael, as we go to change the slides. Well, thank you, and th thank you everyone for joining us today. We're delighted that so many of you from around the region were able to connect today. And for those listening to the recording, um, I'm uh, pleased that you're able to uh, to be part of our conversation in some way. Um, I'm based here in California, but I'm editor-in-chief of Emerald Publishing's Emerging Market Case Studies Collection, uh, which, as many of you know, uh, attracts cases and publishes a, a, a substantial number of cases focused on emerging markets every year from around the world. And we work with our associate editors and many, many reviewers and editorial ad advisory board members in emerging markets to make sure that the stories and the insights from emerging markets are in the classrooms of business school students around the world. And that's what excites us so much about the opportunity with this competition and the ongoing work within the region is to put a spotlight 
to have a very strong focus on the important cases that need to be researched and the stories that need to be told in order for us to teach the important theories that are relevant and applicable to these important, dynamic, crazy, messy, interesting spaces that we have across the region. Um, I was uh, born and bred in South Africa. I've been across here in the US for the last uh, eight or nine years. Uh, and I also teach in a few other places in South America and in India, etc. Um, and I was just saying to the team, you know, based on the last time I was in Cairo, it, it's such a dynamic and interesting place where there are so many fabulous businesses and interesting managers doing awesome work. And it's critical that those stories are discussed in business school classrooms here in California, across Western Europe, everywhere around the world. So what I hope to share with you briefly this, uh, this afternoon are some thoughts about what we're seeing as the role of case research and discussion-based case studies, and some ideas about how you may want to develop a great case study uh, for this competition. So if you move to the next slide, it's really a conversation about real impact. And, and Emerald Publishing for some time, as well as the AACSB and other business school networks, have recognized that just publishing something is not enough. It's great for the resume. It gives us a line in our resume as scholars, as academics. But what's the impact? And real impact of our work, whatever kind of scholarly research work we do, uh, is really about what happens to that after the publication. The extent to which we engage with stakeholders, the extent to which the research and the work is used by practitioners to improve the performance of their organizations, improve the economic situation of so many of our people across the region, and make sure that governance and sustainability processes are enhanced. So it's really about the real impact of our work. And that's where case study research for us is so exciting, because the minute we publish that case study, right, on whatever platform, including EMCS, um, it's going to get used in classrooms around the world. And managers and students and executives are going to be taking our work and putting it into their learning so that they're able to take that and be more effective back at the office. So it's really a conversation around real impact. And on the next slide, you'll see uh, Clayton Christensen's comments about this towards the end of his career. He was interviewed in MIT Sloan about his decades of work within uh, disruptive innovation, as many of you know. Clayton Christensen doing fabulous work in that area. And this is what he said when he was asked about how he went about making this kind of contribution. What was it about Clayton Christensen's work uh, across multiple publications and research projects that allowed him to really make a strong contribution? And here you can see it's about sitting down with organizations, sitting down with executives, longitudinal qualitative research that contributed to his work. So examples like this for us, I think, are great as they inspire us to get out of our offices, off our laptops, and get into business. And when we spend time in business, within industry, uh, we're really writing up research that is based on industry and for industry. Um, and uh, the next example, for example, on the, on the slide is an editorial from the um, Journal of Marketing. And so here you can see John Dayton and his colleagues at the American Marketing Association uh, arguing in this recent editorial about the importance of connecting marketing thinking and doing theory and practice, as many of us have seen uh, in the academy for, for some years now. Uh, so making this point. And then lastly, on the next slide, uh, Michael Porter uh, from Harvard, making a similar point to Clayton Christensen here about his extensive statistical work that would not be able to tell the kind of stories, would not be able to help managers in an illustrative kind of business model point of view uh, until he'd really understand the balance of methodology. So the argument that I hope I'm, I'm making at the start here for you is that we're talking about a portfolio of scholarship. We're talking about many of us sitting in business schools and business departments and universities around the world thinking about the kind of intellectual contribution or scholarship that we're making and being conscious that one type of scholarship doesn't necessarily tell the whole story. 
And whether it's Clayton Christensen or Michael Porter uh, or many of the other leading scholars in our fields, they've recognized that they need to do multiple things. And case research is one of those where both of those examples recognize that writing cases and doing strong case research based on interesting organizations uh, can, can really help uh, develop great theory. So in the next slide, what I try and, and map out is how case research can be done. And there's really two possible paths for case research. What we do on a daily basis when we go out there working with organizations, gathering data, um, multiple types of data, interviews with protagonists and interviews with characters and decision makers, observations within organizations and businesses, looking at different sources, internal sources to the, to the organization, minutes and reports, uh, as well as external sources, analyst reports and media reports and, and, and um, congressional hearings or parliamentary hearings from certain regulators. All of this data that we gather, we triangulate, as Robert Yin says, right? We triangulate the different sources in order to more clearly understand the phenomenon that we're studying. That's case research. It's research typically done on one or a few different cases. Case sites, organizations, people, company, business units, products, brands, whatever the case is. So it's a deep dive using multiple data sources, especially qualitative internal and external data sources. Once we've done that, what do we do with the research, right? What's the output of the research? And there's really two places where case research typically fits. On the left-hand side is a typical um, article case. These, this is case research that we write up as a typical article in a peer-reviewed journal, um, and we put everything into that article. The description, the description of the case, the analysis of the case, the synthesis of different theory, the development of theory, the practical implications, everything's going into that article as a typical manuscript and submitted and published. And we've seen some fabulous case research work that's published in that way. Our focus today, though, is the work on the right-hand side. And that's discussion-based cases or teaching cases. These kinds of cases are written up in two parts. Same kind of data, same kind of case research, but it's written up in two parts. The first part is the case narrative. So this is typically an eight-page document that uh, the organization and the protagonist signs off. This is what's published as a separate uh, kind of product uh, and is made available to students and managers in the classroom uh, and the case that's actually taught, right? That's the case document. Importantly, it doesn't say what happened in the end, right? It doesn't include the solution. It doesn't include the analysis. It is a narrative of a situation at a point in time. That's a great compelling case and we'll talk about how to refine that. The second part of a discussion-based case is the teaching note, otherwise known as the instructor manual. This is a more internal document written by us as case writers for teachers, for case instructors, for other professors who are going to teach the case. It's typically not seen by the organization or the protagonist. It's not signed off by the organization and protagonist. Uh, and it's typically not seen, well, not typically, it's never seen by the students and the managers who are being taught the case. And so when we're doing a case learning session, which is an active experiential learning session in a business school kind of environment, um, we're, we're handling cases. We're dealing with cases. In the background is the teaching note or instructor manual that lays out two important things. The first is a very clear teaching plan. How would an instructor pick this case up and how could they use it? Right? So what are the teaching plan components of that case? And then secondly, what are the, um, what's the analysis and the application of theory? All right, so we have two outputs around case research. Uh, and it's the one on the right-hand side that EMCS, Emerging Market Case Studies, as a Scopus accredited outlet for quality cases in emerging markets, that's where we play on the right-hand side. And that's certainly the focus for this competition and other work in discussion-based cases is the work on the right-hand side.
Of course, some of the scholars amongst us will recognize that the kind of research that we do can live in both places. Uh, and there's certainly some great examples of, of people doing case research and some of it going in one place and some of it going in another place uh, and perhaps multiple discussion-based cases being written up over time as an article case. And so, you know, we can do this good quality case research, this good method, and we can use it in multiple ways. On the next slide, you see those two documents laid out, the case study and the teaching notes. And as I mentioned, the kind of size and who they gets it and who signs it off. Um, and, and we see that for the case study and the teaching note. Some, some additional thoughts here, a little bit about the, the nature of case writing. And so in the next few slides before I hand over, I just want to talk a little bit about style and, and, and tone and structure and what makes a great case study. So on the next slide, you'll see an example of a typical academic article on the left-hand side and a case study on the right-hand side. So take a look at the, at the title. <laughs> Take a look at the kind of writing. Take a look at the kind of referencing. Take a look at style and tone. And I hope you see that although the research underpinning both of these research outputs was similar, the kind of writing is very different because it's a different audience. It's a different genre. And certainly as we see cases submitted to EMCS on a daily basis, um, some of the work that's submitted, it looks and feels and smells and tastes a little bit more like the left-hand side. And that may be really good research, but it's inappropriate for a discussion-based case. Remember, our audience for a discussion-based case uh, are learning environments. So it's about students, it's about managers, it's about executive education. And we need to write it in a compelling narrative style. It's always in the past tense. It's always more of an objective third person kind of view. Um, and it's written almost journalistic in its, in its tone and style, right? We're telling a story. We're taking the reader along. We're weaving in a whole bunch of data, but we're telling an important story, right? And that's different to the way we communicate in an academic article. Uh, so keep that in mind as you, you think about what you're writing and how you're writing. Discussion-based case studies are on the right-hand side. It is a discussion of, of a narrative, a case narrative, and a storytelling approach. Let's spend just a few seconds talking about how you can start. And so on the next slide, um, some thoughts here about where you find potential projects to submit for this competition and to do some great case research in the region. There's really two starting places for most case writers. You either start on the left-hand side with a gap in your syllabus, right? You're teaching a course, like I teach a lot of marketing and strategy work. And so as I'm thinking about marketing and strategy and I want to teach something about family businesses, um, and I recognize that family businesses in terms of managing brands over multiple generations, that may be a, a learning outcome that I want to emphasize in my course. But I have a gap, right? There are some great cases in the world, but maybe there's a gap uh, based on geography or based on recency or based on um, me using cases in other parts of the course. So I have a gap for a case, for a tool that I can use to facilitate learning in the classroom. That may be my starting point to then go and look for case situations that I can access, that I can write up into a compelling case that I can use in my classroom, and then if I publish it, that others can use as well. So if that's my starting point, I'm thinking about learning outcomes, I'm thinking about the kind of topics I want to talk about, I'm considering existing cases and I'm thinking about potential gaps for new cases. And for many case writers um, that uh, we work with in EMCS, that's the starting point for them. They're thinking about their own courses and they're looking to make sure that they have current cases about interesting parts of the world and important uh, types of businesses and organizations that they want to be teaching about. The other starting point could be an interesting story. 
And so you open up the newspaper or you log onto your favorite site or you get a notification on your app and there's an interesting story that's happening that you want to write about. Or an alumni of your organization, of your institution, um, mentions in passing or mentions at a presentation at your class or you see an alumni written about in some kind of newsletter interesting stories that are out there that you think could fit well to tell um, to facilitate learning to tell the story some of you may be involved in consulting as many of us are and that pre presents fabulous opportunities to write up aspects of what your consulting projects are about or what you're seeing in a consulting environment that could be an interesting piece as well and then interesting companies that you come across, um, perhaps even as a customer that you recognize. I, I know some of my colleagues in South Africa, um, I, I remember a few years ago, uh, one of them was doing uh, some work around the house and he was having contractors come in and do some work around the house and he thought their business model was really interesting. Uh, and so he wrote a case study about that, right? Uh, so we come across these interesting stories that, and, and examples that can become really compelling cases. As you've heard me say, access is critical. So contacts, sources, the ability to go in and talk. Now, primary data is not required to make a great case, but it certainly doesn't hurt. And many of the great cases that we see in our classrooms that we publish every week are, are those that use primary data from protagonists, from the organization itself. <clears throat> Two or three comments here quickly around the teaching note. And so on the next slide, you'll see the structure of a typical teaching note. Uh, oh, I missed a slide. Uh, can we go one more, please? Um, one more, there you go. So let's talk a little bit about the teaching note. Uh, here are some of the sections of a typical teaching note. And as I mentioned, this is the internal document that's written for other instructors, that's written for other professors. Uh, and really, we want to make sure that we're developing some good learning objectives. We're mentioning the research method. We're focusing on the teaching plan and how we will teach those assignment questions. And then the second part is how we're thinking about um, the analysis, providing model answers, right? Uh, exam kind of answers for the kinds of questions that we're exploring. We do include, as you can see here in the teaching note, a little bit of an epilogue or postscript. So that tells the story of what happened. And so if the protagonist was sitting in June 2022, having to make a decision, what happened in July? and August and September. What decision did they take and why and what was the outcome? And then let me finish with uh, the next slide uh, about learning objectives because I think this is an important area just to pause on for a couple of seconds. The quality of a teaching note is often related to uh, how well the learning outcomes or learning objectives are developed um, for that teaching plan. And here's the scary secret. Many of us who've done doctorates and who are now in research or teaching positions, professors, instructors, whatever we might be, our, our background is in research. Our doctorates are about teaching us how to do good research. But then we get jobs where we are teachers. And very few of us actually get the right kind of training and support to become great teachers. One of the things that I think we should all do a little bit more about is think about how learning happens. And when developing great teaching plans for cases, we need to reflect on frameworks like this, Bloom's taxonomy, for example, frameworks where um, educational researchers have helped us understand how do adults learn? How do those 17, 18, 19, 20 and more year olds in our classes, how do they learn, right? It's not about content, it's not about slides. It's about facilitating learning, right? I think of myself as a facilitator of learning as opposed to a teacher or professor at the front of the room. And when we shift our role to more of a student-centric or participant-centered case discussion kind of teacher, it's all about the facilitation of learning. And a framework like this, Bloom's Taxonomy, I think is a really important piece of that puzzle. We need to understand that better as researchers who are writing cases for use in the classroom. 
we need to think about how people learn. So not just say, this case, students will understand this, know this, understand that, be exposed to this. Those are quite a weak learning outcomes. So let's think about the learning processes, the knowledge dimension, the cognitive dimension, the action and skills dimension uh, of learning outcomes. So we can develop something that students can walk away from that case discussion, being able to do something differently. So I hope those few comments were useful as you think about developing great cases for this competition. We're so excited, as I said, about receiving many, many applications and seeing the great work that you're doing. There are so many critical stories that need to be told. We hope to partner with you to tell those. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Michael, so much for your, for your talk. Uh, and now we can move to uh, Professor Ahmad Tulbas. You can feel free to let me know when to move to the next slide. Right. Thank you, Nadine, and thank you, Professor Goldman. Um, I would like to welcome you all, and it's a pleasure to be with all the audience here, and it's an honor to be with Professor Goldman as well. Um, this is a fantastic opportunity to talk about something that I have a lot of passion for, and I feel that I know Professor Goldman for long because everything that he said today, I not only concur, but I can I can wholeheartedly say, and I've been saying for long. Uh, so um, uh, I am um, uh, currently the chair of the Department of Management, but I am the co-founder of Al Khazandar Business Research and Case Center in 2007. And I'm very happy to have Inji here, who has been is directing the center right now. And we have we, we share this passion about cases and case writing and how this really impacts education in general. So um, next slide, maybe I can start with a quick um, uh, story about the KCC. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the, about the, 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 the center itself, but the, the story behind uh, the, the establishment of the center. Well, I, uh, when I did, uh, I, before I, I got for, I, I went for my PhD, I worked for Procter & Gamble, and uh, this was a big uh, big transformation for me because I found that how this practical knowledge needs to be disseminated. And when I started my PhD and started teaching actually at, in the US, I started to think about uh, how can I in incorporate that? I know so many cases about the Egyptian market. This was in Egypt. So how many, ca how many cases can I write? And I thought about this is what I need to transfer to uh, the different um, students and the classes. And when I came back, to, you see, I joined in 2006. In 2007, I was there. And I was blessed to, to, to know one of my dear friends, Hisham Al-Khazandar, who is the, 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 the leader or the founder of, um, of the center, who funded the center at the beginning, uh, who is a Harvard graduate and a big believer in uh, case studies. So it took just a few minutes to convince him that we need to, to establish the center. So this is what I want to say. I want to say that this is something that we all believe in. But uh, I know uh, that the, uh, Professor Goldman talked about everything that needs to be to be talked about in terms of case writing and how this is done technically. So I'm going to take another angle so that we can complement each other. And I will talk about how can we integrate that together and how can the, the, this competition and more cases to be published will help in the ecosystem in general and how can it start really transform the education in the region. So in the next, next please. Um, um, I'm going to talk about the regional perspective. What's, wh wh where did I, uh, why did I think about the idea? I thought that uh, I've used cases from Harvard, from Ivy, from many other places and cases are good and they are very fantastic and great learning experiences. However, I always thought that there is uh, something missing when I talk to students in the region. Uh, the, some cases are not very relevant. Sometimes the challenges are not the same. And students in the region will, who will work in the region wants to, want to see something relevant to them. So limited regional cases, this was the first thing. So I started just coming up with my personal experience, bringing in some guest speakers and starting compiling something. And then the idea came, well, we need more of that. And I'm not going to be the only one. And my area is marketing. So what about cases in entrepreneurship, in finance, in other areas? So let's establish a center, something that would be sustainable, that will bring in this. So limited regional cases. So that's why I'm, I really applaud Emerald and I applaud everybody who is trying to do it. Because it's not only that the region wants cases so that they learn how to do business there, but also the international context needs the regional cases to compare, to see different contexts and 
you know, the, the business is global anyway. So that's something critical. Uh, the spe there, is, there, are special, the, there is a special context, different dynamics in the region. For example, the challenges for entrepreneurs are completely different. Uh, I'm very happy that I'm also one of the authors of the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor Report in Egypt. And uh, one of the things that we always see is that countries are different, challenges are different. And Egypt and the region are very special when it comes to special challenges in regulations, special challenges in the ecosystem, improvements that are coming, learning from in the international context, but also applications locally. Uh, the social dimension is very special, the cultural dimension uh, is very special, and also the language barriers are problems. So looking at it from documenting the cases and also disseminating the cases is something that I want to talk about because that's the role of the, of the publications, is that people use these cases as well. So the language barriers are problems. So that's the regional perspective. So um, now I want to, to, to share, can, uh, next slide please. Uh, uh, now this is the, the, what we are talking about here, the, the, the uh, EMCS. I'm very proud to be linked to that. And I always link myself to the center, although I left the, the, the directorship for long ago, but I always think that this is the key. And we always thought about it, uh, that partnerships are the key so that we can disseminate more. And the, this is really something that is going to be great and impactful. And I really applaud this and it's really linked to what we uh, want to do, the partnership. So um, next is I want to talk about, my, my talk here today is going to be brief up and focus on these three dimensions. The case writing, case usage, and case solving. And Professor Goldman talked about case writing in detail. Again, I'm going to focus on it because we are talking about a case competition, but I'm going to leave it till the end, start with the first two, because that's the outcome of case writing. I want you to be excited to see how these cases, when they are solved, make a difference, and what challenges we face in using these cases. So uh, next slide, please. I'm going to, to talk about case solving a little bit. In case solving, I want to tell you a little story. Uh, I'm going to take four hats today. Okay? So the first hat is I was a PNG uh, and uh, employee, and I wanted to really highlight the cases. And then I'm faculty member. I want to utilize the cases in the class. And then I became the KCC director who wants to dis disseminate and publish the cases. And then I became the chair of the department that wants to faculty to use the cases. So it's really interesting to look at all hats at the same time. But case solving requires students to change their mindset. So if I have a good case, if it's not, if students cannot really tackle it well, it's, it loses its meaning. And we have a problem in the region that the mindset would be like studying and taking an exam. So now this is a different mindset. And we need to recognize that changing a mindset takes time, but it needs an effort and a dedication in that respect. Uh, and I tell you a story of how I did it as a faculty member. Uh, I created a course called um, Business Consultancy, and uh, it was a special topics at the beginning. That's the trick that we do in academia always, create a special topic so that it starts, and then we build, it, build on it later. And I built it on cases. So I taught them how to solve cases using the uh, consultancy approach, McKinsey approach and the likes. And uh, based on that, students used to, to, the best students used to represent AUC, in the international competitions and they did great. And what I used to do is I used to bring real life cases. So we, real clients, we write a case about them. The problem is current and the client comes in and the students solve the case in front of the client. And the key that I've seen is that there is only, not only one solution. So we have a teaching note. Teaching notes are extremely important as Professor Goldman said. But when students solve the case, the key is that they solved it based on the mindset of I know that there is no one right solution. Let's analyze and let's come up with something that let's learn the concept and let's come up with a solution that is practical. And the clients were amazed because I had four teams working on the same case, coming up with completely different solutions and the clients came uh, puzzled. Well, I, can, I agree with this and I agree with that at the same time, which one would I go for? So it's a mindset. So if students reach that level, it means that they understand. It's not about one plus one equal two. It's about thinking, analyzing and coming up with an argument. That's the mindset that we want to build. Second is it requires training for students, workshops, also training for faculty, because if I'm a faculty member and I do not know how to manage the discussion, Professor Goldman talked about it, a facilitator of the discussion, it's not really helping. And then the students' competitions, as I said, extremely important to involve them, whether we create ones, we did a lot at AUC, including regional ones, so that students try to solve real life cases and put 
and really uh, put their knowledge into that. Next. I want to talk about case uh, usage. And that's something also that I believe is critical. What if we have great cases, but the, the departments or the universities do not use them enough? So we need to build the school's culture. And that's something that needs to start at the admin level. So we need to say that this is important. This is critical. We need to have incentives for faculty members. If they use cases, this uh, reflects into a positive teaching experience, not just the student evaluations. And it requires faculty training, because again, using the case as a facilitator is not really something very, very simple. And then the teaching notes, Professor Goldman talked about them, so I cannot say better than what he said for sure. Critical, critical. Uh, and they guide the, the faculty member to really go, go for it so that you do not need the faculty member to be an expert and exert too much effort. Let's make it easy for them. And lastly is, next slide please, is case writing. And this is um, where I want to reflect on what Professor Goldman talked about, and I, I, will, I will build on. I will build on it not on how to write the case, but what, how to make this work, how to make this imp impactful now. So requiring a school's culture, as I said earlier, but the culture of writing a case, publication. We are faculty members. We are required to publish in uh, journals. And I loved what, how Professor Goldman started his, his talk about the real impact, about the portfolio of scholarships, about not being limited to only academic publications. So incentives, having the case as something valuable in the evaluations of the faculty makes real, a real difference. But also strong connection with industry. We are teaching business. So how come you do not really link to the problems of the business? And this linkage will bring in more knowledge and will enrich and excite the students as well. Faculty training for writing is critical and the it's not an, a document. It is a discussion-based case, as Professor Goldman said, and it's not easy. It, it's much harder than writing an article, to be honest, because I, we have a lot of data, but how to write it in a very smart manner that people read it, absorb it, and think that there is a dilemma at the end. It's a story, very exciting, and a dilemma at the end, and there is no one right solution, and we need to dig in order to come up with a, a compiled, integrated solution that works. One way of we did it at AUC that I think was nice, and I hope that it's done somewhere else as well, is students as case writers under the supervision of the faculty members. And students are fantastic. They, they collect the data, they're excited about the case, and they write it. It's a rich experience. And also, while, while writing their teaching notes, they establish case-solving skills, because not only they solve the case, but also they need to write the case in a way that multiple solutions or multiple paths could be there and then um, the, uh, they write it in a smart way that excites the reader, challenges the reader, and at the same time, not, uh, uh, not make it like uh, easy to solve, nor complex and impossible to, to solve. So uh, that's, uh, I, I personally think that case writing for, by students is fantastic, especially if they are well mentored by the faculty members. And then finally, the dissemination for usage. It's very important. It helps in the relevance and it can have an international reach for our cases here. So I, I'm sure that the, this, this kind of publication we have can easily be, be used in international contexts. And uh, of course, it's very interesting to look at the comparison between regional and international challenges and look at different cases and maybe synthesize about that. That would be very, very interesting. And last, uh, I would like to, to finish with the way forward. And the way I think about it is that we need to build a case culture in the region. We need to develop a platform for dissemination. Not just everybody does it uh, individually. Training and exchange of ideas among universities that can do that and can be believe in the case uh, method. And there are so many of them. Collaboration among top universities and support for the other universities. So it has to start with the ones that are ready and they can start to disseminate these cases. Arabization is an initiative that we started at KCC, and we believe it's very important because we really want people to think about it. It's a mindset, and if language is a barrier, let's break it. And finally, we have to build sustainable industry partnerships, and that's what that's where education is, is at the high, its highest level. And finally, building or establishing regional competitions over and over will always keep the momentum going. So uh, I'm done. Maybe the last slide would be the slogan of KCC that I'm very proud of, bridging the gap between theory and practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kolbo, for your amazing presentation. Uh, it's really great to hear uh, from, from such a wide experience as yourself 
uh, especially for the MENA region, representing the MENA. Uh, and I could not stress any more about the limited regional uh, cases. Um, so all participants in the competition, you will have a huge impact on the case uh, writing uh, collections and the case writing fields. Uh, because th there is a gap in the regional cases, so everyone contributes in a huge way um, in submitting their cases and writing their cases. So, um, thank you very much. And uh, now we can move to um, Melissa Close uh, to talk briefly about the KCC competition for this year. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for those presentations. They were very inspiring, and I hope everyone's feeling very enthusiastic in the audience about going out and writing your case. Uh, so I'm just going to talk you through the logistics of the competition, because there's some key pieces of information you should know if you're looking to submit. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you very much. Um, so we are very excited to be running this competition with the AUC School of Business. Um, and as you can see on our website, this is also known as the KCC competition. Um, so as mentioned, the aim of this is to really encourage and promote the development of those high quality teaching cases specifically in your region. Um, so we're really keen to work with you and support you on developing your work. Um, if you are interested in, to, in submitting to this competition, competition. Uh, we are now officially open for submissions um, and our submission deadline will be later this year on November 30th. Uh, so there's plenty of time uh, to get some work done there if you're still uh, chipping away at it. Um, and then finally, after the submission deadline, we will be announcing the winners of the competition of this year. So if you're not already Um, Melissa, we can't hear you. This respectively with those figures. Um, so if you receive one of those prizes, congratulations, great work. Um, and all of the submissions, whether they receive one of those top three prizes or not, will be considered for publication in EMCS, um, which is a Scopus indexed collection um, and all double blind peer reviewed. Um, can I have the next slide, please? I think it went forward one. Can I, is there one in between? Or, I think I'm glitching. No. Uh, okay, as I'm gonna assume you can still hear me. Um, I think my connection's getting a little patchy. Um, what I see on the screen right now is case resources and key links. Um, yes, yes. Perfect. Uh, so this is the link to the competitions page where you can read through basically our, our expectations for submissions. Um, all of these submissions um, to be published in EMCS should follow our author guidelines. Um, and there's some more information on the submission process and links to our submission platform there as well to kind of read through at your leisure. Um, we also have some resources to help you through the process of writing itself. Um, so this link to the Cases Hub is a completely free online platform that will take you through the process end to end from choosing um, a need you want to identify in your case, starting writing, um, and then evaluating your case study. So if it's your first time writing, this is a very helpful step-by-step -step guide, um, which has been developed by case experts to help you through this process. Um, it also has a number of different courses that you can take at your own pace um, on teaching a case study so you can become more confident at facilitating case learning um, in the classroom. Um, we also have a number of resources such as previous webinars we've run, um, sample cases so you can see what others look like, um, and also a useful kind of frequently asked questions documents for rights and permissions. Um, so that just helps you figure out what you need to have before submitting in order to make sure that you're all good to be published. Um, and then finally, at the bottom of the slide is the EMCS author guidelines. Um, please do take the time to read through them in full to make sure that you're checking all the boxes of what we expect. Um, and I think I should have one more slide on the early bird. Um, oh, it seems 
well, I don't see it, but for the competition, I'll just freestyle it. Um, we do accept early bird submissions to the KCC competition. Um, so this is to help you, you know, get some early feedback on your case before the final deadline in November. So for this, um, anyone who takes advantage of the early bird submissions would need to send in their case by July 30th. Um, and then you will then get some expert feedback from our judge and EMCS associate editor, Virginia Bodolica. Um, so she will read through the case, make some notes on what she thinks, and then send that back to you. And you can then incorporate all of those comments um, before resubmitting before the final submission deadline. So it's a really helpful opportunity to, you know, improve your case just that little bit more before that final submission deadline. So we really do hope that you take advantage of that opportunity. Um, and as I mentioned again, the deadline for that is July 31st. Um, if you have any questions about that, or if you'd like me to resend information on the early bird deadline, um, this is my contact info up on the screen. Um, feel free to send me an email and I'd be more than happy to talk about submitting to the competition. Um, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Melissa, for your uh, talk. And uh, now we can move to the questions. I can see that there are a couple of questions put in. Uh, first, can you ensure that you share some sample case studies and teaching notes? These, you will find them on our website. I believe we have uh, a couple of samples and the, the link for them can be sent in our follow-up uh, email. Just make sure that you have opted in uh, accepted to receive marketing uh, emails from from future from Emerald so that we would be able to send you this. Um, is there a certificate? We normally give out certificates for uh, the case winners, uh, but we can provide certificates for attendance for this webinar. And um, hello from Morocco, Abdel Ghani. Sorry, hello. Um, for the for sharing, there are several requests to share the slides and the uh, PowerPoint with the recording. Um, again, just please make sure that you have accepted to receive future marketing emails from Emerald, and we would be happy to share uh, the slides with you along with the recordings. Um, thank you, but I'm looking for a more in-detail session on how to write a case study. This was actually going to be one of our polls, which I will now put through. So now I would like to ask everyone to tell us if they think they would like to have a more detailed further session or further webinar about case writings. How can we access the certificate? So the certificate of attendance should be sent in to your email. Uh, again, just please make sure that you have accepted to receive future emails from uh, Emerald. Uh, love from Pakistan and we love you too from Emerald and from our panelists. Um, can you please share, reshare details on important dates? So I believe the most important date is the um, a deadline of submissions, which is the 30th of November, 2022. Uh, and uh, any information or further information that you want, you can always check it through our competition website. Thank you, Osman, for your feedback. Um, how can we access the recent webinar? So the recent webinar was um, a highlight from the 2021 um, competition and you should find the, all the previous webinars. We are going to add them uh, as well on the website. There should be YouTube links um, to direct you to all of last year's uh, webinars. Can I pick up on that point about um, 
template cases or example cases. Uh, I think it's yes, a critical sure. point. And if I think about how I learned to write great cases, really two important aspects of that. The first way I learned to write great cases is by teaching great cases. Uh, and so to Ahmed's point earlier, um, you really, as a, as a case writer, you want to be a case teacher. You want to get some of the best cases, previous award-winning cases from these competitions and others, and you want to build them into your courses and make sure that you're teaching cases in your courses. And I think that will, will really familiarize you with how great case writers are doing what they do. So that's the first piece. The second piece, though, is you need to do. You need to start. You need to start writing the case. Um, and it's an iterative process of going back and forth and getting feedback and thinking about how to make different sections better. Melissa's comments about the Cases Hub, I think, is a fabulous tool as part of that process of writing your first or second case. Uh, and so log in and you will see template, um, templates for a teaching note, templates for a case study, uh, examples of case studies, uh, opportunities to help you develop all the different sections of uh, the case and the teaching note. So I think there are so many resources available. Um, you know, I come back to these two points, teach a whole bunch of really good cases and think while you're teaching them about how they're put together. And then number two is you just need to start and you need to put pen on paper and you need to start developing the case and then iterate and develop from there. Um, may I add also to this? I think I completely agree with the two uh, points. Uh, I would like to add also that whenever you want to start, uh, when you interact with an industry partner or somebody who, is, um, who has um, a, a potential case, uh, the first step is to discover um, a dilemma or something that the case will be about. So I, I was always going to do interviews. Whenever I start, I start searching for this dilemma and maybe it does not come from a first interview or what have you. But you always, your mind is listening, but your mind is working on what would be this case about. Can this case, can this company generate more cases? How can I focus on one and focus on a specific dilemma? And uh, and this will be the focus of the case. And then I come back and reflect. This this iterative process works, but also not going and interviewing without a purpose. You have to be very well organized in that respect. So that's my third cent to the points just Michael mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe there are more technical, uh, sorry, not technical, like more related to how to write the cases. Can the case be multidisciplinary marketing information systems, human resources and management, or do you advise to stick to a specific field? So if, um, yeah, Professor Michael, if you mind? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think for many of us, the buzzword is focus. For many of us, the, the core idea in, in case writing is focus. And I think the reason focus helps us when we write cases is we're teaching it in a 75 minute or a 90 minute class. Uh, and it's tough. It's tough to teach too much uh, in, in a class, right? Because it's not just about telling, it's about facilitating learning. And that takes time and discussion and reflection. So you know, great cases are often quite focused on three or four learning outcomes and a specific kind of topic. So, so I would say that that is probably where I would I would start is write a focused case. Um, there are certainly uh, multidisciplinary cases and cases that are used across multiple courses or used multiple times within a course across a number of class sessions. You know, I, I teach a case in Johannesburg um, about Vodacom, which is a, a Vodafone subsidiary in South Africa, um, and it has an HR angle and a marketing angle. And so I teach it in marketing, and then one of my colleagues teaches it in HR. Exactly the same case, exactly the same students, a few months apart, and it works really well. But those are few and far between. Uh, and so I think for early career case writers, I would strongly encourage you to focus. Focus in on a topic or a learning outcome. And I think once you develop the craft, um, certainly try your hand at cases that can be used in different ways. 
okay. uh, I, I completely I concur completely I think that's best uh, and as I just said is you need to um, uh, look at a dilemma something very specific something that would really deepen the learning of the students when discussed and uh, if you have multiple multiple opportunities in multiple departments by the same company like several articles several cases so um, but uh, having a case that has different dimensions it to, we lose focus and it does not work well and the case loses its essence that's um, definitely critical okay. that's great uh, we have another interesting question can a case study be on a leader or icon from history whose philosophies are relevant in today's context or reconciling dilemma so i think there are some fabulous stories that need to be told some of those are a little bit more historic my caution about older stories or older situations is unfortunately we know that young people today <laughs> those young people today we know that students unfortunately are looking for things that they can identify with that are relevant and so cases or situations that are five or seven or more years old um, are less likely to be engaging and compelling for students so, so I think we really need to, if you want to tell a story that might be 10 years old, you can integrate that 10 year old story into a case where that organization is facing something as well now in 21 and 22. So, you know, we, we can build in context, we can build in background, we can build in history where we can show some really interesting choices from the past. But the dilemma that Ahmed's talking about is a now dilemma, because you want a student to grab the case and see something from the last few years at the most that they can identify with, that they can try and solve, right? That's what makes a case so powerful, is the student puts themselves in the decision maker's shoes and they have to solve something. So, you know, solving a case from pre-COVID right now might feel less relevant right the world has changed think about solving a case in a previous political dispensation in some of our north african countries feels like a different world and so the recency i think is really important for cases to work well in the classroom and so i would be cautious about cases that are too old uh, cases where there isn't a more recent dilemma that students can get their teeth into yeah, I completely agree, and I think the key is the learning outcomes. What are we learning from this? And uh, I don't, I want, we want to differentiate between uh, an example or something that they just uh, excites the students as a as a past story versus a case that they think solve have different opinions, different options. So I would uh, caution about that. I would use the, these examples, but I would not consider them a case or a debate that will be discussed. That's uh, that that would be it yeah okay uh, another question we have lots of questions here and i'm trying to not exceed our time but um can you tell us what is a, a diagnostic research example so when we think about that I, I think if you think about like a medical situation right you go to a doctor and you have some symptoms and the doctor tries to diagnose what the problem is. Consultants, as Ahmed said, consultants often come to organizations and say, ah, revenues are down, customers have stopped buying, I wonder what the problem is. So it's a diagnostic kind of approach. And so if you're writing a case where the dilemma might be a little bit broader, and it might be a family-owned business or a third-generation business or whatever it is, um, and, and it's not entirely clear exactly what the problem is. Those are interesting cases to write where, you know, I, I'm seeing some indicators of a problem, but I'm not too sure what the underlying problem is. And that would be, I, I would refer that to more as a di diagnostic case. So it doesn't have to be option A, option B, pick one and justify it. That, that's a lot more of a kind of a tangible dilemma, but the dilemma could be a little bit more strategic or a little bit more broader where I'm seeing revenues falling off the cliff and I'm seeing customers less happy. I wonder what the underlying issue could be. And you give enough information in the case for the students as doctors to diagnose what the problem is. Yeah, I concur about that. Okay. Uh, we have um, so many other questions, but I'm afraid that our time um, has now been exceeded and uh, I would like to express my utter 
delight to have everyone here attending and for Professor Michael Goldman, for Professor Ahmed Tulba, for our partners, uh, Inji and Shireen, for Melissa. Thank you guys very much. And um, like I said in the beginning, you should receive the, the recording and we will send the presentation in an attachment uh, in a follow-up email. And for any further um, information, please do not hesitate to contact uh, me or Melissa for any further details. And please also check our website for the competition details. And thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.